Um, Welcome to Tony at 12. Today's guest is Professor Michael Minelli, the future Lord Mayor of the City of London. Uh, we're in conversation regarding Michael's journey from Seattle to the City of London. Michael, super to see you. Great to be here, Tony. Always a delight to chat to you and the audience in the islands. Thank you so much. Right, you were born in Seattle, a city famous for the Space Needle, Monorail, Boeing, Starbucks, Microsoft, and Frasier. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I quite like the last one. I am a big Frasier fan. To be fair. We too. But I, but I did leave when I was six months old. So All right, so it was a, it was a nominal stay. <laughs> yeah. But, Having but, founded Microsoft in his infancy, he then moved on. <laughs> you then moved down to Orlando. I had a quick look at Google. That's 3,074 miles by road from Seattle. Well, to be honest, I, uh, I, it, it's even more complicated than that. I went to 18 schools in four countries. Um, and we, we as children used to have a definition of moved. Everything had to go into the uh, van and come out of the van right. so things like staying for two weeks in service accommodation or something didn't count as moves um, and I had about 26 moves in my period there were six children and obviously two parents and the uh, and it was like and by the time my father passed away sadly last year I think mom and he had had um, something in the order of 65 moves between Good them heavens. yeah yeah so, very so mobile no, I, up yeah. mobility plus <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about schooling because i mean obviously you you did fit a, a few visits to the school in with your various moves <laughs> but but of course you went to harvard um yeah. so that's what fairly close to boston isn't it uh, apparently apparently well you know they don't, they don't necessarily admit that <laughs> and then the london school of economics Trinity right. College Dublin right. and Harvard College is that the same you know was that a sort of return trip or um yeah it's the same yeah so. yeah 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 what did you study there ooh, ooh. well um, Harvard in in the 70s uh, as much of the Ivy League was in a uh, in a fit of um, liberal arts uh, which I hasten to add I thought was absolutely fantastic um, and so what you did was you did 32 uh courses over four years mm -hmm. sort of for each term uh and i deliberately wanted to have the widest variety i could possibly uh, have and to do that i uh i went up originally intending to study physics i did study physics um but i also did anthropology uh latin uh, linguistics uh, russian literature greek um chemistry biology the lot um because you could do them all if you knew your way through the system uh, and that meant uh, taking it I, I worked out in my second year that my concentration as it was called would be government because government only required me to do eight modules in the department right. of which one module uh, could be statistics one module could be history one module could be economics one module could be writing leaving me with just four uh, and the four that I chose were one with uh, Har uh, with uh, sorry with um, Henry Kissinger, yeah, <laughs> one with uh, oh what's it Edwin O. Reischauer, the great uh, the great uh, Japanese Chinese expert, uh, one with Otto Eckstein, uh, and one with uh, Nye. So uh, you know who wouldn't do that? So I I really got out of Harvard with a, a degree in government uh, which wasn't government at all, uh, and that was great. And then I went off to, to Trinity. I was actually working and I, I went into Trinity. I managed to get onto their fourth year uh, mathematics and engineering uh, course because I did actually have the qualifications. And then at LSE, I did a doctorate in statistics. Mm. So not your normal trajectory of, uh, of of doing all of your kind of hard hard math sciences up front. It was all spread throughout. And technically, the degrees came at the end. Yeah, yeah. But an in, in interesting time. And, and obviously... <sighs> Am I right in thinking, you know, at some stage it was probably a toss up between academia and, you know, business? Oh, oh definitely. Or or more arguably research. I, yeah. I love research. I was paying my way through university doing postgrad research mm. uh, in architecture, land planning, cartography, missile systems. So I was actually getting paid as a postgrad researcher, you know, from the time I was about 18. 
that's the only way I could afford to go to the school. Yeah. Because uh, it, it is a darn expensive school. Um, so I've always been attracted by the research side, but uh, I had started this enormous mapping project in Switzerland um, in the late 70s, uh, which ultimately became something called uh, Geodat and another project called MundoCart. Uh, these were the first digital maps of the world, sort of Google Earth 1983. We yeah. brought out a CEO wrong. And that kind of made a fortune. It's also why I came to the UK. We were, frankly, after cheap labor in Cambridge, you could get a Cambridge graduate for about 1,700 pounds a year. So we, we set all of that up uh, uh, between what was 82 and 85. Um, Big Bang, it hit the city in 84, and I started mm -hmm. paying attention to that. And I thought, oh, they're going to need computers too. Uh, but when I got to the city, I realized that finance was also equally fun and interesting. So I uh, qualified as a securities trader and qualified as an accountant. So I've always been kind of wherever finance meets technology, I, I have a lot of fun. Yeah. And of course, past conversations that we've had ha have sort of looked at various aspects of your life from that point of view. Um, as far as you're concerned, obviously, London became a major attraction as a place to be, to live, to work in and everything else. <clears throat> Is, you know, how did that come about? Was it just you like the place or? <laughs> well, I mean, what not to like, and uh, we we always have the old Johnson quote. You know, I'm certainly not tired of life yet, <laughs> although I I did hear a good one the other day. You know that this this cost of living keeps increasing, but uh, but living is still popular. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so okay. I I, I, uh, I love London. Uh, yeah. Always have, uh, yeah. and I love a lot of other cities too. Yeah, sure. London, yeah, London. London was if you go back to the 1970s and 80s. Um, it was actually arguably the easiest city uh, internationally. One, because what people forget is uh, exchange controls mm. were still in place in large chunks of the continent. Uh, and to be fair, London only removed exchange controls in October 79 uh, under Thatcher. It's one of her first uh, moves. Um, second thing was air traffic, uh, air travel. So if you liked international travel, it's yeah. air. And remember, you had all of these national carriers charging you, you know, you know, nose nosebleedingly high sums of money to travel. And London had a, a moderately free market. So I was very anxious having uh, left the Swiss company, uh, Patrick was a nice company uh, in 85. I, I wanted to set myself up in a place where I could find it easy to travel in and out. Mm -hmm. And London fulfilled that. And of course it's cosmopolitan, it's exciting, it's interesting. Visas were very, very light. So, you know, you had lots of interesting people coming in. Uh, have lots of uh, traditional connections in the Commonwealth. And to me, that's that's what exemplifies London. It's not a better city than others. It's not a brighter city than others. In fact, frankly, in the late 70s and early 80s, it was pretty uh, dumpy. Mm -hmm. But it is, one of the most, it is one of the most connected cities. Yeah, I, I yeah. celebrate those connections. Yeah, and still is, of course. Yeah. Um, in uh, 1994, then, you founded ZN. Um, and uh, we can see it behind you. <laughs> Never miss the marketing opportunity. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's gone from strength to strength. And, you know, it's an internationally acclaimed think tank, isn't it? Yes, yes. We, uh, we're famous for a few things, but probably, sadly, uh, a smaller area of our business, which is running three indices, the Global Financial Centers Index, the Global Green <laughs> Finance Index, and the smart centers index do get it. We're a very small firm. We're 25 people. Yeah. Uh, you get us, you know, massively in the press. We, uh, I, I have a friend who runs a very large insurer, a very, very, very large insurer. And he always brings to his marketing department uh, his searches on us in the press, which are half the size of his gargantuan 100,000 plus man firm. He's kind of, why can they do this? And we can't. And <laughs> Go as a consultant. <laughs> I, yeah, I wish I, I wish I, you know, but if you name your firms, Yen, you, you know, the one thing you've definitely assured is that nobody's going to come to you for marketing advice. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> now, you're involved with the Gresham College, which uh, is uh, an institution going back a long, long way, isn't it, to the time of Sir Thomas Gresham. Tell us a little bit about your involvement on that. Yes, well, uh, Gresham is just a phenomenal institution. Uh, people say it's a hidden gem. Of course, you, you hate that, but uh, it's less hidden these days. Uh, it's getting a, a nigh on 20 million lecture downloads a year. Wow. Um, it founded, uh, well, but basically, if you go way, way back uh, to the late 1400s, Erasmus uh, and a number of others, we call them humanists today. But the phrase that they used for themselves was the new learning. They said, we, we are the new learning. And this was the 
early stages of the, um, well, effectively of the scientific method. And in fact, uh, Thomas Moore and John Cole uh, were, were actually new learning adherents. Uh, they were also Mercers and Interestingly, amongst the Mercers was uh, Thomas Gresham. And Gresham had been doing a tremendous amount of work with the Low Countries over the years. So he's born in 1519 and he dies in 1579. And he brought three inventions to the UK. Or inventions. One was the first Bourse. Mm -hmm. That was originally in Ghent. Then Antwerp copied it. And then he brought it over and said, we ought to have this. Uh, he brought the idea of the shopping mall. He also brought, believe it or not, uh, we, we only found out when we did a biography of him four years ago with John Guy, he also brought double entry bookkeeping. So those are three <laughs> things he did. Uh, but it wouldn't have made uh, much of a difference except that the low countries then picked a fight with the Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, and here Gresham almost had a ready-made infrastructure for their ideas to come over. When he died in 1579, he left his money and he was, uh, there are arguments about the history of this, but it, it, certainly in one sense, he was grotesquely wealthy. Um, he owned Austerley Park, large chunks of the city when the city was 25% of uh, the British GDP, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and he left it all to the new learning. Um, and so the college was founded after a tussle with his widow in 1597, and it offered uh, lectures free to the public in London. So remember, at this point, there's a cartel in Oxbridge. Mm. Uh, there's no center of higher education outside of Oxbridge, which really breaks that. Uh, if you went up to Cambridge or Oxford, the dons would open the door, gab at you in Latin and slam it back in your face and laugh at you for not being fluent in Latin. And they really weren't interested in some of the things that Gresham was interested in, in particular, you know, shipping, astronomy, navigation, shipbuilding, uh, trade, commerce. So he founds his seven chairs and they've just been running forever. Um, and we appoint the, the various, uh, uh, later, uh, the Royal Society comes from Gresham College in November 1660. Uh, Christopher Wren uh, was a Gresham professor. Robert Hook was a Gresham professor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been mm. a real mm. powerhouse. And since the web has opened, now we have something like, I think we're up to three and a half thousand lectures that you can download free. Uh, mm. Gresham's yeah. always been free. Yeah. I call it a Tudor Open University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Now let's uh, turn on to public service. Um, mm. Because obviously you've been very involved with that over the years. What what was the appeal initially for you? Well, is, yeah, I think everybody has a has, has deep within them, a, a, you know, a desire to give back. I guess mm. is the current phrase. Um, and you know, I, I I've been involved with numerous charities to do with either education, which is dear to my heart, or the environment, uh, both of which I'm, I'm quite passionate about. Um, why would I want to give? Uh, so much time and energy to the Corporation of London is a really good question when there's plenty of other causes out there. And it really came from working with the corporation. Yeah. Uh, so the corporation is, if you want to take one really interesting point of view, it's the oldest worker residence cooperative. Uh, we, we could play this a little bit, but um, origins probably about 640 AD when the sheriffs start being elected. Um, around the 800s, the Court of Aldermen is certainly in a proto form. Uh, by the time William uh, I arrives on, on the shores in 1066, it's a fully formed entity <clears> and it's <throat> the corporation. It's the original yeah. use of the word corporation. So it's all been around for ages. But what I found thrilling was when I had problems uh, in regulation in the 80s as a senior partner in an accounting firm, I would go to this, what a lot of people would say is a local authority. It's not a local authority. It has local authority powers only to find that they would help me lobby and convince people in Brussels that these things needed changing or in Whitehall. Uh, brought the carbon markets. So uh, numbers were really excited about the use of, uh, of, of emissions trading for the Sox and Knox markets in the mid nineties uh, when Kyoto came up in no November, sorry, December, uh, 1997. And it was agreed that carbon markets would be there. We went to the corporation, uh, not to central government, and said we'd like to create a shadow trading market so that we can build on this and bring the markets to London. And the corporation did that and supported it. So <clears> it was that working with the corporation <throat> on several projects that made me excited about it and like it. And uh, and then somebody said to me uh, 11 years ago, you know, maybe maybe you ought to think about becoming an alderman. Uh, and I said, how do I do that? And they said, well, you run for office. And yeah, so I, I, I ran for office. Um, I've had a long, strong personal affiliation with Broad Street, which stretches from Liverpool Street to Bank. That's my ward. And so when I ran in my ward, I knew the people and, you know, 
got elected and got reelected. So yeah, yeah, true. Be the alderman for Broad Street rather than just an alderman. And then, of course, uh, you went on um, to become a sheriff, one of the two sheriffs, and uh, you've got a two-year stint on that one due to COVID. <laughs> yeah, that was that was an exciting period for us. We, uh, we we actually got to do something. I'm not sure you should always want to get to do something. Um, the sheriffs are normally, uh, they, they live at the Old Bailey, and they're responsible, in theory, uh, for taxation and defense of the city. Mm. Uh, but more importantly, actually, for the rule of law, we run the 18 criminal courts in a in a chairmanship way. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a kind of a light bit, and go around to dinners and promote rule of law, uh, et cetera. Obviously, during COVID, uh, two things happened. One is we were appointing a new recorder who runs the place. So it was a little bit more hands-on than usual. And also a lot of changes needed to be made. So we doubled up the courts, uh, automated them, uh, permitted remote sittings, et cetera. All of this was done as a team. I, I wouldn't claim that Chris, my brother, Sheriff, and I did all of this on our own by any means. But it was very interesting for us to be involved. And then we were asked to stay on for an extra year uh, to provide continuity. So that was that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I found it much more intriguing. And I came out a, a bit of a junkie on criminal law, which most business people don't know, uh, mm. sat in on trials, uh, et cetera. Um, and also came away amazed at what the judges do and also a, a little bit disappointed uh, in our uh, judicial and prison services, not the people in them, but you know the backlog and the underfunding yeah. of it yeah. over so many decades. And of course, COVID must have meant a big pile up in terms of numbers of uh, cases waiting to be tried. It did. Uh, the British numbers went from, a, it was roughly a two-year backlog before COVID though, Yeah, so, which is pretty sad. You know, I've mm. got a lot of shy clients who say you tell us we don't have a justice system well you know i've got news for you if you're arrested in china you'll be up for before a judge within a few months on your case yeah not not two years on remand for a serious crime uh mm. if you can't bail um and of course that went up to three years um, i don't know the current figures i was actually at the old bailey a few weeks ago and it is coming back down again yeah. but yeah starting two years is still not any good so we've, we've still got a long way to go in the uk uh, to do that. And we also have, I think, to think about, you know, what do we really achieve from prison? Um, you know, if we want rehabilitation, there are lots of models like the Norwegian model we ought to be looking at. Do we want punishment? Well, if it's punishment, why? Um, there are ways of running prison systems with, uh, believe it or not, very successful ones with about a tenth, an eighth to a tenth of the same population per capita mm. um, at about a quarter of the cost. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'll hear these things that, oh, the Norwegians spend twice as much per prisoner. Yes, they do, because the idea is not is to get them out of the prison system and back into back into society and back into work. Um, so I, I, I would encourage, and I have been since, I, I, I haven't found a sheriff yet who hasn't come out much more of a, an evangelist about the mm. improvement. Uh, having, all, having actually seen it at the sharp end, as it were. Yeah, a bit of the sharp end. I think anybody in the system would say, "Well, he's still naive. He's only had two years." And they're right. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But but at least you you know you come out with a better grasp of what's going on, rather than the sort of um, view that me, for example, as a layman, possibly has on, on the matter. Now yeah. let's let's get on to the business in hand, Michael, because uh, the Lord Mayor of the City of London, not to be confused with the Mayor of London. Who? And and quite <laughs> and, and it's you <laughs> or oh, will okay. or will be yeah. from Michaelmas. Yeah, well, let's uh, first say I, I, your very generous introduction was uh, just 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 for the record. <laughs> um, uh, my my position at the moment is among there are twenty five aldermen in the city, and yeah. those who have been Lord Mayor are what's called past the chair, uh, and those who haven't been are not before the chair. They're called below the chair, uh, which. I think makes people who've had the chair feel very good. Uh, so I'm what's called senior alderman below the chair. And then the, the the sort of formal city phrase would go and subject to election likely to be the next Lord Mayor. Yes. Of yeah. OK. So just well, to, to, I, I, I didn't mean to create a situation that was embarrassing. <laughs> No, it, it's it's perfect. <laughs> we, we need to we need to to, to say that. Uh, but in some ways, that 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 clarity helps a wee bit. So yeah, um, there'll be an election on the twenty first of September, uh, to which the livery will come to 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 the guild hall, and then if I uh, am uh, proposed, I will be proposed delivery with any other alderman who's eligible. Um, all, all aldermen who have been sheriff and are currently an alderman are eligible. So yeah, uh, there will be three or four. Uh, but we've agreed, the, the court has agreed to support me. Um, 
and then the livery will choose two from that number. Yeah. Uh, and then the court of aldermen will vote on one of those two. Okay. Um, that's the formal process. Uh, and, it, you know, I, I'm very much looking forward to my year. And the reason we've organized it this way over the last few decades has been, um, well, as you can work out the timings yourself, you wouldn't know until the 21st of September you were likely to be Lord Mayor. You'll be coming in on the uh, second Friday before the first Friday before the second Saturday, I think is technically how it mm, works. Yeah. So on the 10th of November. So you'd only have between the 21st of September and the 10th of November to plan everything. So we, we've built this up as a program. Uh, and we've given the uh, SABTAC a sad name, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> the absolutely. SABTAC, <laughs> the senior alderman below the chair yeah. uh, is given a little bit of resource to get some planning done and to yeah. make some commitments. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's been designed to make the mayoralty work better together. And we are. Um, you know, the, 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 the um, alderman had just stepped down as Lord Mayor Vincent Keveney. Uh, Vincent did a fantastic job on people and purpose was his theme. Uh, Nick Lyons is currently Lord Mayor, uh, Chairman of Phoenix. Uh, his theme is financing our future, and he's yeah. been very much looking at uh, engaging that globally. And mine's going to be the knowledge mile, celebrating, in fact, those connections I spoke about earlier. Um, and so I'll be able to build on both Vincent and Nick's program, but because we've all been planning these together, um, you know, in, in a connected way. Now, you're heading up a tradition that goes back to 1189, when the first holder of the office was Henry Fitzalwin de Londonstone. Correct. And that, that is incredible, isn't it? To, to sort of think that you're going to be um, Lord Mayor of the City of London and looking back on all that history. And in, interestingly, I, I, I see that um, we sort of saw a form of devolution here, Michael, because it was... Uh, the sovereign that chose the Lord Mayor up until King John and Magna Carta and everything else. And then after that, um, the City of London decided. So it's essentially they devolved from the rest of the country at that point. Would that be unfair? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, there's a lot on YouTube about the City of London and mysterious and kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Did you know? Did you know mm. in the heart of London there's something else? Well, uh, the sad bit is some bits of the YouTube things are true. <laughs> so, um, and and if, and if I'm in a wind up mode, I, you know, I can't have a lot of fun. And in fact, I think it was uh, during Brexit for April Fool's City AM ran an article saying, you know, the other night, the alderman of the city of London met in the crypt of the Guildhall, and there is a crypt of the Guildhall, <laughs> and they decided that they'd bring out their own cryptocurrency uh, if Brexit were the case. So, you know, you, you can't play it. Um, in truth, where it does get interesting, I'd actually go back to the sheriffs, believe it or not. Um, they were elected uh, in part from about the 640s, and, mm. and nobody's, uh, you start digging into some of these histories that you pull off of Wikipedia, and nobody's actually too sure whether or not people were elected or appointed in many yeah, cases yeah yeah uh, and and a lot of the research is going back and forth on it uh, as more of these uh, primary texts have been digitized uh, a lot of researchers are beginning to see more as they're making it up so for example um it used to be said quite quite right that sheriff was a shire reeve mm. well there weren't shires in the 600s so what was going on there reeve uh, clearly means tax collector but some people have put forward that there's another word sure which is related to city, so city tax collector, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying I, I, I get much of this, but you see that moving all the way forward. Um, Henry Fitzalwin may have been elected, believe it or not, uh, not too sure, or put forward by his fellow aldermen. So there, there's, again, some confusion uh, there. So we just don't know. But what is true is that the city's first formal relationships with the crown uh, really were when the crown itself became instantiated nationally in a solid way. And that was with William I. And notice I said William I. And I know you're out there in Alderney and you may have different views, but we don't call him William the Conqueror here. Uh, he never conquered the city. Uh, but we, we have a, a warrant uh, from him, uh, which is the Charter of 1067. So a year after he's uh, taken over Hastings, he finally concedes he needs to reach an agreement with the city. And he, he concludes this charter. Um, there's another charter, I think, from memory in 1139. Uh, and then there's another charter around 1189. And then there's a further charter, 1215, which we today call the Magna Carta. Yeah. And all these charters just say is that the city keeps all of her rights and privileges. Um, what's, of course, interesting is that there was an act in the 1800s um, that 
that establish the legal basis for entities like us. And the Corporation of London is what's called incorporated by prescription from time immemorial. What that actually means is uh, incorporated by prescription means that you uh, can do what you do if you prove that you've always done it yeah. since X time. And time immemorial in our case is Richard the First, Richard the Lionheart. So had Richard the Lionheart had surface-to-air missile batteries, uh, we could probably have them. Um, but we, we we still maintain the uh, the bridges uh, because we've always maintained them. Sure. We maintain a police force because we've always had our own militia. Um, we retain the rights to manage the markets because we've always had that. So that's actually our legal basis is sort of uh, these these statutes with the crowd. Now, if I were to do that and play the city state game, uh, one I'd be slightly off base, but it's just kind of fun to play around a bit with it. Uh, in terms of getting people excited, but it does give you at least some latitude to do things. And that's sure. yeah, yeah. I guess we got to mention Dick Whittington, haven't we? We have to. Uh, he was he was actually alderman for Broad Street, but then he went renegade, and he oh he, right, he became an alderman for Lime Street, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, and and in fact, you know, Dick Whittington is still relevant today. The Mercers still maintain his charity. Mm -hmm. um, the alms houses that are still being funded out. It. It's it's difficult to describe that how. In the medieval era, well, in fact, even up into the 70s, many people would actually give their bequests would go to the Corporation of London. Yeah, They trust the corporation to see their bequests through. Uh, and that was the case of Whittington, and that was the case of Gresham. Uh, and the, the sums that they left were gargantuan in relative GDP terms, but wisely invested over centuries. They're still gargantuan sums. Because in interesting, um, I read in in one of the bits of research that apparently he sold the cat to a Moorish prince who paid a fortune for it, and that's how he financed himself. That, I, I've heard that one, but I I can't. Well, you obviously it. can't <laughs> corroborate it. Now, tell me about the um, fact that the Lord Mayor of the City of London is actually has uh, precedence over all individuals except for the sovereign oh no that 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 that, that is definitely a fiction it is um, unless you're inside the city walls yeah 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 you're quite yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then then, 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 then it the, does apply doesn't it in truth you know we, we are delighted when uh people from uh the court uh, or people from government come and visit they are our guests and we, we are fine but yes there there are some protocol issues mm. which mean that, uh, the lord mayor does take precedence in a in a ceremonial sense there's no legal basis for it in, in fact one of the weirdest things i found out being sheriff was that there's no legal basis that the sheriffs are effectively um kind of adjutants to to the lord mayor it's just city protocol and yeah. that's good we like yeah. our tradition you know we yeah. like upholding them and we're proud of them. Uh, as you gather, you know, one of the things you're going to be an alderman or get involved with the corporation, you better like history because it's going to come at you. Because it's going to come at you big time. Absolutely. Now, um, after you uh, are inaugurated, is that the right word? In Well, elected and then installed. So okay, it, uh, Ele after you're elected, elected on, and installed. Elected on okay. the 21st. And then on the 10th of November, um, there's a ceremony called the Silent Ceremony. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's called silent ceremony because the Lord Mayor says about five words, and that's about it. Uh, and it's uh, it takes about twenty five minutes, and it's held in quiet in the Guildhall itself in front of about six seven hundred people. And what happens is the outgoing Lord Mayor hands over the keys of office, the purses, the sign, all of that's handed yeah. to the new Mayor, uh, and then they they take their office. The following day is far more exciting. There's a big parade, the Lord Mayor's show. Uh, which is absolutely thrilling. And we have a really great time uh, doing that. Um, and then you get to the serious business of doing the job. Yeah. Now, you you will be known as the Right Honourable Lord Mayor of mm. London. Does that mean that you've got access to the Privy Council during your year or? No, it, it's got, uh, there's no relationship. Between okay. The mm. right, right Honourable was an honorific. Yeah. Which was common and it, it applied to Lord Mayor, but there's no Privy Council relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, from from that point of view, um, you have the title, but not you're not going to have to sort of get too involved in politics. <laughs> well, we, we um, did have uh, when Her Majesty passed away. You know, yeah. we were uh, the older monarch actually part uh, uh, part of the uh, success 
Council of Succession or whatever it's called. So we, yeah, we we did have a small role in that, which is to say, yes, we like it. <laughs> yes, I, I thought that, I, I, we watched as much of that as we could, and uh, <clears throat> it was noticeable that uh, one of the first ports of call were was the city, wasn't it? It, it was in fact it is um, that's written into this that, that it, we are the first uh, yeah. port of call. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it, it's part. It's it was again part of the uh, the monarchy trying to establish a relationship with the city, knowing that it was sort of in and out at the same time. Um, it's you know, if you, if you look around the world, you'll find many capital cities and countries where which are which are centralized have this you know, to sometimes difficult but certainly uh, a potentially tense relationship uh, with whatever the governing monarchy or national body is. So Paris to the National Assembly, for example, it, it can get quite touchy because you've got somebody who is potentially, in theory, able to overthrow, if you see what I mean. Um, that's certainly not on our minds, but <laughs> you, you, you see where I'm headed. When you get into federal systems, um, say, take America or Germany uh, post-war, those sorts of structures are a little bit more relaxed about mayors and things because there's no one overweening mayor. Mm. <clears throat> a lot of the conventions that have evolved over the centuries have been to achieve a, a good state of balance between the mayor of London, the Lord Mayor of London, and the central central government. So, looking at your schedule from um, September onwards, it's going to be pretty busy, isn't it? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, in totally terms of busy. you know yeah. promoting the city and everything else. Well, that's the core role is promotion city, and it probably divides into two major chunks, internal and external. Um, internally, uh, my program is what's called the Knowledge Mile. I'll be celebrating the connections that London has with the world about knowledge, and London is a place to get things done, to have solutions to big problems. Yeah. Uh, we'll be doing a lot around the sustainable development goals, um, but what London can bring to bear in science and technology, as well as finance and business and professional services. So we'll be really pushing that. Uh, we actually have more people working in science and technology in the city than we do in finance, technically, at least at the um, at least level of what their jobs are. Um, and it's always been that way, going back to the uh, Royal Society foundings and science. So that's one chunk of it. I'm hoping to have a few experiments in London where we can see that we're doing things. And we'll be certainly uh, convening a lot more sessions. Our, it's our convening power. That, that makes us powerful um, you know, to convene and get people talking about improving productivity in the nation uh, by getting people to work together and deliver. Uh, abroad, uh, the Lord Mayor visits typically about 25 countries uh, with approximately 100 days out. So 365 days, uh, you know, mm. 120 working ones uh, ish, about 100 will be spent out of the country visiting those 25 nations. Um, and in that, I've got a couple of highlights. Uh, every Lord Mayor seems to get a highlight. Um, uh, so I'll certainly be down at COP28 uh, in yeah. the United Arab Emirates because the city has been supporters of pre-COP, you know, Rio, everything. We had the first Clean Air Act in the UK in 1953. Uh, the city's really great on green and green finance. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the Olympics in Paris the following summer, which I'm also looking forward to. So those are two uh, big, big parts of the package, and we'll be running across a whole slew of countries promoting uh, London as a place to solve those problems and trying to encourage more and more connections here uh, for the benefit of ourselves. Uh, let's be you know, frank about it, uh, but for the benefit of the nation and, and hopefully for the benefit yeah. of the world. Yeah. Now, you, you've mentioned uh, your various uh, tasks ahead, and of course, you are going to be Admiral of the Port of London, so you've got a nautical thing there to contend with, Michael. Oh, yeah. You, you've got about, uh, you, you get about 85, uh, you know, ex officio yeah. type posts. Yeah. Um, you know, the provost of City University. Oh, well, in fact, president of Gresham College. So uh, looking forward to I actually am genuinely looking forward to being a nautical guy. i uh, very much looking forward to being out of a port. And there's a tradition I'm teasing the officers, but, I, I, well, I'm not teasing them. They think I'm teasing them. I'm kind of serious. There was a very, very old tradition which lapsed only in the late 1800s, and that was to visit the Thames boundary stones. So the right. Admiral of port would go upriver to Staines. Mm. There's a boundary stone there marking yeah. the limits of our waters. And there's another one uh, down just outside Chatham, uh, in, uh, so in Lower Upnor. And I'm hoping that we could at least get a boat to go to both ends. And re That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be really good. And <laughs> if any of your listeners, in the, given your nauticalia, we are trying to hunt down 
anybody who knows what standard or burgee or pennant a Lord Mayor may have used in the past. We can't find this yet. Right. I've got the whole library looking at this. It'd be nice to recreate it uh, and have it on a boat. Well, we we'll try and find out from this end for you. Thank you. <laughs> Answers you on the postcard. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Lord Mayor number six hundred and ninety-five. Yes, it's a big, and big, and big, change big. of residence. Do you actually yes. live, will you actually live at the mansion house or? Yes, I'm going into council housing. <clears throat> right. Okay. <laughs> Social housing. <laughs> Social housing. Yeah. So yeah, we're uh, no. It, it, you almost have to. You know, funny enough. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I found staying in the old Bailey uh, was worth it for a couple of nights a week because it just yeah. saved that time of getting in. But at Mansion House, your your first meetings start around seven, so you're up at six getting ready. It says seven. You you most nights you won't get home. You got to uh, be there. Yeah. Well, we won't get in bed before midnight. Yeah. yeah. You, you yeah. Know, but of course you want it, so it's a uh, sure. dedicating it your just life to make a difference. Yeah, but very much so. Make... So uh, I'm I'm excited. My wife's excited. She's uh she's thrilled. She was an enormous help when I was sheriff, and she's looking forward to doing it that's really good that's really good yeah i'm afraid we've run out of time in fact we've probably gone a bit over time but can i take this opportunity of thanking you very very much for sparing me time it's always a pleasure to speak to you possibility of another one before you actually sure um not only that i'd love to chat to you about a number of subjects yeah uh, we've we haven't spoken for example recently about no. uh, need a renewable energy uh yeah which I'm thrilling um, I'm actually down in Guernsey uh, this week um, on on Thursday night and Friday. If any of your listeners are in Guernsey and want to link up in the bar, um, so so we're doing that. Uh, and I'm hoping I can get a, a trip to the Sh Channel Island scheduled as Lord Mayor. I don't fully control that budget. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah, quite. I, yeah, but, uh, I am at least uh, I put the idea forward that that's something that I I would be keen on doing. Yeah, is getting to the islands. That would be really good. Well, wish you all the very best. I know it's going to be a total success. Nothing can go yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you take care. You're too kind, Tony. I'm looking forward to seeing you and uh, chatting with your listeners in the future. You know, Thank I, you, you know, very I'm... much, Michael. Really appreciate it. All the best. Bye. Bye